Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And in the line in this series of the Survival Guide for Healthy Living, the first in the series that we're going to address is food. Now, when we're talking about healthy living, we want obviously healthy foods. The healthiest food out there are, is always going to be raw foods and living foods. Foods that actually have life, enzymes, nutrients, no chemical additives, artificial flavors, sweeteners, none of the stuff that you're going to find 95% in the grocery store uh, are going to qualify as raw foods. And then if they're not organic, the rest of them are not going to qualify as well either because of the chemical pesticides and additives. So when we're talking about a raw food diet, the definition is foods made and preferably organic foods from fruits, berries, vegetables, raw seeds and nuts, dried fruits sulfate free or sulfite free, algaes, sprouts, legumes, meaning raw, raw beans, honey, raw agave, cold pressed oils and spices, none of these treated or heat treated above 104 degrees. So that's the definition and that encompasses real active food that will make a difference in your life. So I have a lot of people come in when I talk about the raw foods and then they come in with their inflammation and cancers and fibromyalgias and blood pressure and everything else and I say well let's go on a raw living food diet um, where at least 50 to 75 percent of your foods come from raw or actual live living foods not heated above 104 degrees and most of us are not taught to eat that way we're taught to cook everything and what happens when you cook, most of the enzymes and a lot of the nutrients are lost in foods. And that includes homemade soups, all that wonderful stuff that we've associated with health. Yeah, you're going to get some vitamins, a few vitamins and some minerals, but you're going to actually, actually miss out on most of the nutrients that make it wonderful and good when it's raw. So when you're looking for raw, I mean raw, and I have a lot of people that come in and say, well, what about frozen? What about frozen? And I'm like going, well, you know, there's some things that aren't in season that you can't get, like blueberries and organic strawberries and a few things. And, and if they're organic and they're, most of the companies guarantee they're frozen, right, it, immediately within packing, so pretty close to it, you're going to be okay. You're going to lose out on some of the nutrients, but as long as you're not heating them, you're going to still get most of the benefit. Once again, this is supposed to be a raw and living foods diet, not pulling out things that are full of, you know, you know, freezing and flash burning and dehydration and that type of thing. So when we're talking about like dried fruits and dried vegetables, or excuse me, dried fruits particularly, we're talking about those who, that have been dried with very low heat, below that 104 degrees. Now, there are some foods that are classified as being super raw foods. Now, a lot of people, I know at our deli, we put on sprouts and we, we sprout our own sprouts in the deli and we put those on. But you can sprout your own uh, in, in a sprouting jar. So you can buy these jars um, that have like a mesh topping to it. And I meant to bring the sprouts so you could kind of see what they look like. And what you do is you soak the seeds overnight and then every day you wash them and drain them and wash them and drain them. And within about two to seven days, you have live active sprouts that most of which have only grown from like about two tablespoons of sprouts into pew, real live living foods. Now something else we don't think about, um, you know, we always want raw nuts, um, organic raw nuts, but in order to release the actual real nutrients of raw nuts, soaking them for about eight hours overnight is the best way to get to activate the enzymes and the nutrients of the raw nuts. So if you've got raw cashews, which I know that's all we carry at the store, raw almonds, they're best if they can be soaked in about three times the amount of water. And the same goes for like your dried fruits. If you've got your little dehydrator and you're drying things that are in season and you're storing them, if you can take those dried fruits and just soak them in about you know, two to one ratio with 
two parts water, one part fruit. It'll absorb the nutrients and once again release the enzyme activity and it will make the item alive again. So soaking as best that you possibly can to bring in those superfood uh, qualities. You know, um, there's a kind of a big debate about sprouting and the bacteria content and all of that. And when you go out to a grocery store, your odds of getting salmonella are, are pretty, pretty increased. But you know, when you sprout your own and you've got your own clean containers and you're changing the water out and all of that, the risk is just so extremely low. I, I, it would be even not even a ma marginal uh, risk factor as long as you're watching. And then you use your sprouts within two to three days. The same that goes with your, uh, if you're going to soak your vegetables or, or you're going to soak your nuts. You have to, if you keep them out for more than 12 hours or soaking for more than 12 hours, you got to put them in the fridge. So logic dictates here as well, once you're trying to make something alive again, obviously bacteria and other things can grow on it because anything that's alive again, bacteria and fungus are going to want. So that's what makes it alive. Now, when we're talking about a raw food diet, a lot of people ask me, okay, what are raw foods? And the obvious is always going to be, you know, you've got your organic fruits and vegetables. And please, I can't overemphasize raw organic certified organic fruits and vegetables. Not some grocery store or uh, that, that irradiates, which is the majority of the grocery stores, they have organically produced produce, but they irradiate to elongate the life. Or a lot of the local farmers markets, everybody thinks they're organic. 90% of what they have there is not. So unless they have posted certified organic produce, you're not going to get that. You would like to use the produce up as quickly as you possibly can because the longer it hangs around, um, it does lose its nutrients with time. Um, and of course now, after your vegetables, thinking about nuts and nuts, seeds, almonds. Now almonds are fruit, remember. They are not actual nuts. So they come off a tree and they're classified as fruits. But like I said, when you soak them, then they become real raw, raw foods. Uh, dried fruits, particularly apricots, raisins, figs, and dates are extremely nutrient dense. And if you come down, I can even show you all the vitamin content in a lot of these uh, types of fruits. Uh, they do tend to have a lot of sugar, but remember too that they're also nutrient dense. Balancing out in a raw food diet, protein, fats, and then the carbohydrates of the fruit is still always important. You don't want to sit there and eat all raw fruits uh, and, and say, okay, I'm eating a raw diet because then that's going to mess with your blood sugars. So, you know, a, a sense of logic dictates as far as you're going to want to make sure you have protein, fats, and carbs at each meal. So, your cold pressed oils. So, when you're talking about cold pressed oils, most grocery stores don't carry these, uh, don't carry them at all. So we're talking about cold pressed olive oils, flaxseed oils, and once these are open, they got to go in the refrigerator. Grapeseed oil, they'll last for a little while out, um, a few weeks maybe, but once again, they're live foods, cold pressed. After a few weeks, logic dictates you better, if you're going to keep them longer than that, you're going to want to put them in your refrigerator. Remember cold pressed oils have a, um, it doesn't change the molecular structure of the oils. They actually, the body receives them as being very beneficial and helpful. Any plant-based oils that are heated um, change the molecular structure of the oils and they actually can become carcinogenic. So nice cold pressed oils when you're making your salads, uh, your tabbouleh, any of those kinds of things. You know, there are a lot of books out there, several books that you can order on Amazon to get raw food recipes. Very helpful. Um, raw honey or agave, raw agave nectar. Now, these are sweeteners that you can use that are actually enzyme rich. Now, raw honey is never a liquid. It just doesn't come that way. Most of the time when you get honey and it's a liquid, well, 90% of the time, it's either been as in the case of most of the grocery stores, only 10% honey and the rest of it high fructose corn syrup, or it's been heat treated. So if you're getting honey at a local health food store and it's in a nice warm container, forget it. It's destroyed most of the raw um, aspects about it. 
Honey, raw honey should be solid. Um, in the solidified form, that means it's truly raw. Um, agave, by its nature, is a liquid, but once again, you want to look for raw agave uh, nectar. They, don't, they still raise the blood sugars to some extent, but if you're going to sweeten them, at least they have enzyme and nutrient benefits. And like in the case of raw honey, you can use a little bit on your throat, even when you have sore throats, because it helps kill off the bacteria. Um, it has a, like a hydrogen peroxide content that helps heal things. Um, fermented pickled vegetables. Boy, my German mother was really good about these. She would eat raw sauerkraut, raw pickled things continually, a lot of which were just packed in the, in the, in the container with salt, allowed to ferment in brine or whatever, and there we go. They have a lot of good nutrients for the gut that help your good bacteria flourish and grow. Just like your organic fruits and vegetables, especially uh, your ground vegetables, have a lot of soil-based organisms. So when I hear people say, oh, don't eat any ground vegetables, you know, no carrots, no, no anything, turnips, nothing that comes and is down in the ground. And I'm like going, yeah, there may be a little starch, but there's also soil-based organisms contained within them. And as long as they're adequately washed, they can very, be very, very beneficial for the gut. Um, spices, herbs, and sea salt. Now, when you are on an organic uh, raw food diet, that should be what you're using. You're using your, your parsley and your turmeric and you're, you're pulling your, your, your nice cutting your little culinary spices off the window seal. You know, you're, you're dicing up your garlic. You're taking all those wonderful spices, onions and all of those, and you're using them to flavor your foods, okay? So when you make a nice coleslaw, you've got a wonderful texture, taste, smell uh, to the actual vegetables themselves. Oftentimes people just make vegetables boring. They don't use anything that can enhance the flavors and spices enable you to do that. Um, algaes. Now I know a lot of people say, okay, the algaes, we're talking about uh, you know, the nori, the seaweeds, um, the chlorella, the spirulina. These can be added to protein uh, shakes or protein powders or smoothies. They're very rich in protein, but they're also rich in chlorophyll and superfoods. So that's the list of ingredients. Um, having a food processor, um, a Vitamix, some type of blender is very helpful. Or if you're into just dicing and slicing up your vegetables, adding your culinary spices. Now with a lot of things like rice, legumes and all, you can take those actual um, uh, grains and you can soak them in water. It'll absorb the nutrients and they're very edible without ever heating them as well too. So you can make things like rice dishes, tabbouleh and things like that. Now the benefits. You know, you always wanna have that cost benefit ratio whenever you look at anything. And that includes when you're eating that bag of Cheetos or Doritos. And I'm gonna say this, full of, full of red dyes, chemicals, I mean, literally, when you tear it apart, my son brings it in and he's munching on them and I'm horrified because I know his behavior is about ready to change because of all the red dye number 40 and the chemicals in there. And I can watch it occur. So when you're doing a raw food diet, you're not picking out anything that is full of chemicals or additives. It's toxin and chemical free. So number one, you're not gonna fill your body full of toxins and chemicals. Um, a raw food diets um, are rich in enzymes uh, and they alkali the blood. Basically, when you alkali the blood, your blood, you lower the risk for causing all diseases across the board, whether they're autoimmune, whether it's cancer, whether it's uh, blood pressure and diabetes. Those enzyme-rich foods lower blood sugars, blood pressure, they aid in mineral utilization in the body. Uh, my gosh, reduction of inflammation and pain. If you eat a raw food diet, you're gonna watch your pain levels plummet. I had a customer that I was discussing two days ago, the raw food and my, my plans to talk about this, and she said, I was reminding her, she has rheumatoid arthritis, and she was coming in talking to me about it, and I said, I suggested the raw food diet, and she says, oh yeah. She said that I did that years ago, 
and my rheumatoid arthritis went into remission. So that was just one example of what we can do with raw foods. Obviously, a lot of times people don't want to hear that foods can, can actually cure uh, diseases, but they can basically prevent them from ever occurring. And that's the place you want to be in, not having them in the first place. Um, a lot of uh, my customers will come in with a lot of acid reflex, digestion issues and all. And remember, raw fruits and vegetables have their own enzymes. Uh, they break down. Now, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to break down the fibers, but those enzymes are, or enzyme-rich foods aid your digestion and feed the body on a cellular level. The goal here is 50 to 75% organic raw foods. And if you need more help uh, with this, you can stop by the Lompoc location. And we can talk about it a little bit more at the vitamin and herb stores. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today I'm going to show you a couple of exercises that aid and abed lung expansion, energy, and they work very, very well at a desk as long as you don't mind. <laughs> well, people may hear you breathing a little bit, but it can help wake things up, stimulate the thyroid, and get the spine uh, going so that your energy can be uh, reawakened and alive again, and the boss can get more out of you. So the first exercise, you put your hands on your shoulder. Now, I'm a yoga instructor, so these are things that um, I go through in my class. We go through breathing exercises. But hands up on the shoulder, we're lifting, um, you know, you're almost parallel with your, uh, your arms. And what you're going to do is you're going to turn to the left and inhale, and then you're going to turn to the right and exhale. Inhale to the left, exhale to the right. So I'm going to do this for you real quick. We start off slow, and we increase it for about a minute. But I'm going to do a little shorter duration. So it's inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. That's an example of one. So you're turning that spine and you're all, but you're also inhaling through the nostrils. The tongue is placed behind the upper teeth and you're expanding the lungs out. The next exercise actually can help stimulate thyroid and wake you up as well and improve your energy too. And it's just a matter of being able to squeeze that thyroid gland in a way. So you're raising your neck up and then you're lowering your neck down. And if you can try and tense the muscles and then act like you're holding a pencil underneath your chin. So you're not letting your neck all the way down, but it's like you're holding a pencil and you're flexing the muscles around the thyroid gland. Now, when you do that, that squeezes on the thyroid and the parathyroid. And it literally says, boys and girls, wake up. I'm ready to do more work. Anyway, I hope those are a couple of desk exercises, one involving the breath, one involving stretching and moving and um, pushing around the thyroid. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Dracciano. And Ralph. thank you for that intro. We're going to try to cover four topics today. First being magnesium may be as important to kids. Bone health is a calcium. Surprise ending. Children with milk allergy may be allergic to school. Parents who suck on their infant's pacifiers may protect their children against developing allergies. Research reveals the possible reason for cholesterol drug side effects. And vitamin E identified as potential weapon against obesity. Of course, that's after the drug companies tell you to stop taking it. And to start off, magnesium may be as important to bone development in children as calcium. This article basically published in the Pediatric Academy uh, Academic Societies, otherwise known as POS Annual Meeting in Washington, D.C. What they did was this. Researchers recruited 63 healthy children ages 4 to 8 who were not taking any multivitamins or minerals to participate in the study. Children were hospitalized overnight twice, so their calcium magnesium levels could be measured. 
And here's a surprise finding they found out. Results showed that the amounts of magnesium consumed and absorbed were key predictors of how much bone the children had. Dietary calcium intake, however, was not significantly associated with total bone mineral content or density. So they may have to turn your world on as far as a way of thinking may be in reverse. The magnesium may be more important than the calcium. It's kind of tough to believe, but it looks like it may be that way. So it may take a while, but look at your children's diet. Make sure they're getting pounds to be salmon, salmon, almonds, and of course, they say basically long other foods that are high in magnesium, which are real important. So almonds are real easy to get into a child's diet. So you think about it, magnesium is real important as far as increasing that bone density. All right. Children with milk allergy may be allergic to school because we just talked about calcium. Now we're talking about milk. Well, about 300,000 children have milk allergies. Of course, they believe most children grow out of the milk allergies by the age of three. Of course, these milk allergies can cause shortness of breath, asthma, wheezing, you name it all across the board. And that's the key word, board. Because certain things in schools, actually everywhere, can trigger milk allergies without having to consume it. And one of these surprises is chalk. Low dust chalk uses milk or casein, so to say, in order to reduce the dust load of that chalk. Casein and milk protein, as they say, is often used in low powder chalk. When milk allergic children inhale chalk particles containing casein, light threatening asthma attacks and other respiratory issues can occur. This was published in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And just as a side note, Milk proteins can also be found in glue, paper, ink, and of course, other places in children's lunches we never even guess. So something to think about if your child's allergic to milk or if you're allergic to milk, watch out for that chalk. It may cause an allergic reaction and you'll never know why. Or paper, ironically. Next, one that sounds kind of gross, but has an incredible health benefit. Parents who suck on their infants' pacifiers may protect their children against developing an allergy. It has been suggested that exposure to harmless bacteria during infancy may be protective against developments of allergy. However, it was difficult to pinpoint which bacteria a baby should be exposed to and at what time and which route of exposure. In a group of 184 children, I read it verbatim, who were followed from birth, the researchers registered how many infants used a pacifier in the first six months of life and how the parents cleaned the pacifier. Most parents rinsed the pacifier in tap water before giving it to the baby after it had fallen on the floor. However, some of the more grosser parents out there also boiled the pacifier to clean it, yet other parents had the habit of putting the baby's pacifier in their mouth and cleaning it by sucking before returning it to the baby. It was found that children whose parents habitually sucked the pacifier <laughs> were three times less likely to suffer from eczema at age of one and a half years as compared, as compared to children whose parents did not do this henceforth boil or wash. When controlled for other factors, they concluded risk of developing allergies such as the parents delivering by C-section, ironically, and the beneficial effect of parallel sucking the pacifier remain. So that's something to think about. We know when the child is born C-section, they do miss a lot of the beneficial bacteria. So children which are born through C-section, it may be an added benefit for their parents. Well, if you lost the bacteria one way, Start sucking in that pacifier and put it in your baby's mouth. You never know. You can save them for a lifelong uh, effect of developing asthma or eczema. Sounds gross, but hey, if it works, what the heck. All right. Now, let's look at it this way. What if I told you there's a medication out there that basically have a significantly negative impact on your daily life, your interpersonal relationships, and your ability to hold a job? Mm. Sounds like taking this medication may you line you up for the unemployment line. Well, in an article titled, Research Reveals Possible Reason for Cholesterol Drug Side Effects, 
is this the reason why. University of Arizona researchers have identified a clue to explain the reversible. It's reversible. Memory loss sometimes caused by the use of statins, one of the most widely prescribed medications in the world. So the university, of, this is kind of interesting, they didn't plan on discovering this, but it's fun on how they did. University of Arizona researcher team made a novel discovery in brain cells being treated with statin drugs. They found out there was unusual swelling within the neurons called the beads on a string effect. It's so bad, it's very noticeable, and basically it threw them for a loop. And what they did is this only happened with statins. And this was published in Disease Models and Mechanisms. How they discovered was this. Clinical reports know that statin users are often told by physicians that cognitive disturbance experienced while taking statins were likely due to aging or other effects. However, the University of Arizona's team research offered additional evidence that caused so such declines in cognition was due to the negative response to statins. They also found that the team removed, when they removed the statins, the disappearance of the beads on a string also restored normal growth. And this is how they discovered, I apologize. At the time, using a blind screen library of 1,040 drug compounds, the team read tests on fruit fly neurons investigating the reduction of defects caused by mutation when neurons were exposed to different drugs. The team had shown that one mutation caused neuron branches to curl instead of straight, but certain drugs corrected this. The research findings were published in the 2006 Journal of Neuroscience. Then something, then something serendipitous occurred. Say Big Kraft, who was one of the researchers, observed that one compound, then another, and two more created all the exact same reaction. Mm. That this, these bulges, which were called beads on a string, Kraft said, were only the end, were caused by statins, and statins were the only drugs to cause this beaded neuron effect. At the end of the early investigation, the team decoded the library and found that four compounds that resulted in a beads on a string were, in fact, all statins. The team would later determine that after removing the statins, the cells were able to repair themselves and neurotoxicity was not permanent. And this is important because even in adults, they realize it's reversible. When you go on statins, yeah, you're becoming goofy and everything else like that. When you went off, it was reversible. What's important and their concern was this, is the given statins to children now. Mm. If statins have an effect on how the nervous system matures, this could be Devastating, said the researchers. Memory loss of any disruption in memory and cognition can have quite severe effects and negative consequences. Wow. Think about that when doing statins. Unfortunately, my time is up, so I won't be able to run the next one, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, thank you for joining the show. We appreciate it. Do your research and ask questions if you need help from us. Thank you.